So this week we're going to delve into the study of prehistoric art. And prehistory simply means before written language. So actually there was art that was prehistoric art in, on this continent way up until the 15th and 16th centuries. Now before we begin this, I want to talk a little bit about my first experience with art history, which was way back when I was an 18-year-old first-year art student, fresh out of high school, and the, oh, it was dismal. We were all in a big auditorium. There was the heat. It was very hot because it was an art school in Florida. Air conditioning did not work very well at all. I remember the sound of the fans and my teacher would just go over slide after slide after slide and he had this kind of voice and I could not stay awake. So as I got older and as I became you know, a professional artist, I began to see how much we really can learn from history. And I've become fascinated with the study of art. In my work as an art conservator, I've been able to work on incredible old works from the head pots, the Medina head pots, to um, an engraving by Hogarth from the 1700s. I think that was my favorite old piece to work on. So now I have a real goal to move beyond just the slides and the droning of my lecture voice and so we'll see what we can do to make it a little bit more interesting. You know, as we study the remnants left behind by various cultures in the study of early art, we can use our mind's eye to imagine what motivated people to go to great lengths to make beautiful objects even before they had any system of writing to record their history. People create art for so many reasons. To express religious ideas or feelings, to make money, or to express power, or to have a political influence through propaganda, through um, art that's created to show others that the government is powerful. They create art to beautify practical tools or implements, plus countless more reasons. There's probably as many reasons to make art as there are people who are making art. Although there are common threads that run throughout the history of art in relation to how it is made, there are also great differences in various cultures as to how artists are treated, the importance of artists in cultures, what the function of art is, and what motivates people to make images. Often, I'll say usually, we are left with more questions than answers as we study art the history of art in these early times. Let's look at prehistoric art. As I said, it actually means before written history, before written language in any culture. Many illiterate people develop very complex societies, but so prehistoric does not mean primitive. Um, I've used the example of the Native American societies. When we get into the Cycladic cultures, the, the islands of Crete, they had incredible cultures with, with indoor plumbing and elaborate palaces, but they didn't write it down. So we don't really know a lot about them, only from what we can find in artifacts. So let's first look at a couple of vocabulary words. Art in the Stone Age. We have the Paleolithic period, which begins about 40,000 BC until about 8,000 BC, although in our text, in the book text it goes back further. So what I'm more interested in you learning is that Paleolithic is early, is old. Paleo means old. And Neolithic is the newer period as things began to change. And it's easy to remember if you know Paleo means old and Neo means new. Paleolithic was first, Neolithic was later. Now in the Neolithic period, that's when people began to settle and farm and form villages. And that was a very important period in art because they had to uh, make implements and, you know, the potter and the miller and the stonemason. All of those people really came into their own once people um, settled into villages. Ah, but let's talk about cave painting. The earliest signs of humans creating images that we know of today goes back at least 35,000 years. And this was primarily in the form of cave painting. The early artists 
worked deep in hidden caves, working only by dim lamps and toiling on tall scaffolding actually built into the cave walls. They created this beautiful artwork that seemed to have served some kind of a ceremonial purpose, and we really don't know what that was, although there are many theories. There are two caves in France that we'll be looking at, Altamira and the one at Lascaux. Both of these caves were found by children. Lascaux was discovered in 1940 when three boys followed their dog into a hidden opening in the rock and found this cave. Now let's look a little bit at the image below. It looks like a panther or maybe a bear. I think it's a bear. But notice how the artist has done this image over and over again and has rendered it really uh, realistically and quite beautifully. The quality of line is exquisite here. So cave painting is a very mysterious form of art. As, the, as I said, they walked hundreds of feet into dark caves, lighting their way with dim lamps that burned animal fat and wicks made of moss. Then they constructed this scaffolding, and they actually lived on these scaffoldings for days. We can tell because we know that they ate there. We can tell the remnants of that. And as they painted these large pictures of animals. Now, it was probably for some kind of a religious ceremony, but again, we don't really know why. Maybe they felt that by painting the images of the animals they were preparing to hunt, they would bring forth those animals. Another theory is that they would throw their spears at them to um, exemplify or to symbolize hitting the target. Now, one other interesting thing is that you very rarely see human beings depicted here, and that gives rise to the theory that they were some kind of ceremonial purpose. Now here's an example on the left of a human being. See, he's like Birdman um, compared to the bison, which is actually quite believable. The one on the right is a cave painting from Africa and is one of the few realistic depictions that we have. Oops, sorry, didn't mean to do that. Let's go back. It's called Dance Around the Slideshow. Here we go. I'm going to talk a little bit more about how the cave painters did this. I find it so fascinating, maybe as a painter myself, or maybe just as a human being. The, pi the pigments, <clears throat> some of the pigments that they used are on the right. They would use ochres, they would use stones um, that they would grind up, and they would make this powder that created color. And of course, usually the colors that they used were found right around the caves that they were working in. Up above, on the left, is a typical kind of a lamp. We would find several of these, many, many of these, around a site where cave painting was taking place. And the one on the bottom is a little bit more of an elaborate, um, kind of a special lamp that someone created. Let's talk a little bit about sculpture. Okay, one of my favorite things is the bird flute. What they did was this is made out of an animal bone. Actually, I think it's a femur bone. Well, first we'll start with Venus of Willendorf. There was, oh, she's called um, Woman of Willendorf now. So the Woman of Willendorf is fascinating because all over uh, Europe and Asia, there's these figures that look almost exactly like this. They're usually a few inches tall. Uh, some of them are even smaller than that. So they could fit in a pocket or a pouch. They almost all have, well, the, the women of Willendorf all have huge breasts, big bellies, no face. So in a time when everything you ate you had to catch, um, it makes sense that abundance would be exemplified by someone who is very heavy. Also, there's the fertility. Maybe she's pregnant, but we don't really know. But it's thought that these figures were to maybe bring good luck. And they were obviously widely traded because they're found just really all over Europe and Asia. This is a bone flute. So it's actually not out of a bird leg. It's out of a femur, I believe. But these just really draw my attention because it fascinates me that throughout history, way back when, when life was so simple, they still had the urge to create music, to create melody. And somehow somebody discovered 
the first person to discover this, that if you put holes in a flute, you could create a tune. I just find that really beautiful. And um, these are 2,000-year-old duck decoys from Nevada in that uh, slide in the lower left. Stonehenge. Let's talk a bit about Stonehenge. Now, Stonehenge uh, was built about 3,000 years ago as people were setting, settling into their agricultural society. And it took about 1,250 years to build. The early builders dug through the turf to reveal this chalky white circle. And the largest stone here weighs over 35 tons. And it came from a quarry 23 miles away. The cross stones, or the lintels, were placed 23 feet above the ground and are 15 feet long. Now this is a lot of statistics, but think about it. These are big, heavy rocks. Now the circle also includes what we call blue stones that weigh several tons each. And these came from a mountain range 150 miles away. Well, we really don't know why they built this. And there's some theories of it being used as a grave site that are recent, that, have, that are in your text. And that's probably why it was built. But look at this picture in the lower right. At summer solstice, the sun rises exactly over that distant stone. So that obviously had something to do with why Stonehenge was built. Now, in addition to Stonehenge, we have these megaliths, big rocks that are all over Europe, where people, for some reason, would make these stone circles. And they've even found um, hinges, a hinge is a stone circle, as far away as in China. So that's just one of those things that we don't really know about. Oops. So we have here early dwellings. What I want you to really see about this is that they used post and lentil construction to even build their shelves. Now to understand post and lentil, you can see it in the slideshow, power, the PowerPoint slideshow uh, with the material this week, but it's basically a board across the top supported by two boards on either side. Now this is something that the Egyptians used to build their massive temples. It was used to build these early dwellings. It's really important in early construction. Now in the slide, in the PowerPoint this week also, they'll talk about childhood, which I can't really say very well, but it's an early dwelling in Turkey and it's fascinating because it's the most preserved early dwelling that we know of. Now I'm going to just touch on a few things that I find fascinating. So this is a drawing of a, the Native American city called Cahokia. Anybody know where that is? East St. Louis today. At its peak, the city of Cahokia numbered from 10 to 20,000 people within the city walls. And there was about 10,000 more people living nearby. Over 500 mounds were discovered in the area plus skeletons which have led archaeologists to speculate that the people of Cahokia may have practiced human sacrifice. Now the city also had a circle that aligned with the sun at summer solstice. This circle at Cahokia was made of 48 posts and the 49th post marked the place of the sun at summer solstice. So it reached its peak about 3,000 years ago which is much later than the cultures of Europe the prehistoric cultures of Europe, there are many similarities between the two cultures. So let's just talk for a minute about the Great Serpent Mound. I wonder if any of you have been there. This is built around 1000 AD, so it's much newer, but I wanted to take a look at this as it is also prehistoric art. To get us an idea of the scope, here is stairs, okay? So we don't really know why they built it, but I like to imagine the people that first came across it. And lastly, we'll talk about the Hopewell, because they were such great traders. And they lived along the Mississippi, in the Mississippi Valley. And within their villages, we found mica from Appalachia. We found, they found copper from Michigan, turtle shells, and shark's teeth from Florida. And this is a soapstone pipe with a beaver decoration. And I just like it because it really exemplifies the artistry of the people. So this is the overview with my voice. And now I want you to go ahead and watch the PowerPoints, which will have links to the online course content.
Okay, thanks for listening, everyone.